Matthew chapter 6, for those who have their Bibles or you're using your mobile device. I normally don't read the scripture, but for the sake of the context in which I should preach from, I will share one verse with you. The 33rd verse, and it says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and all of God's righteousness, and then all these things will be given unto you. But seek ye first the kingdom of God. It's not on your screen. And his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. I want to speak from this subject in a form of a question today. Where have you been looking? Where have? You've been looking. My brothers and sisters, I want to suggest to you in the impetus of my dissertation today that progression attracts opposition. You missed it, so I'll say it again. Progression attracts opposition. That is to say that when you set your mind on something to accomplish, it alarms the enemy to send their accomplice. And to that end, the enemy and their accomplices has a central goal in mind. And that is to stop what you have started. Therefore, when the spirit of progression is over my life, I must expect some type of opposition. The reason why many of us lose in the battle, because we are too readily accepting and allowing our guards to come down. I don't care how much money you have. You got to keep your guards up. I don't care what you've been healed from. You got to keep your guards up. I don't care what you have as an asset. You got to keep your guards up. I don't care if you got on a beautiful wedding dress marching down the aisle. Ready to receive your husband and your husband is waiting on his wonderful bride. Every step you take, you better keep your guards up. Because just as excited as you are about receiving your marriage... The enemy is eagerly anticipating on destroying it. I wish I had a witness here. I don't care how many promotions you get. You better keep your guards up. Kids acting great in this season, receiving great grades. They got their own honor roll. They got scholarships. But you better keep your guards up. There was no family drama this year at the family reunion. Everybody just sung, it's a family reunion. Still, keep your guards up. See, I've, 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 I've come to this conclusion that there are too many individuals who are operating their lives on incomplete. I'm going to say that again. There are too many individuals who are operating their lives on incomplete. And I'll add this in for extra on to be continued. The honest reality is, it's not that incomplete is ineffective, but it's inefficient. Just think about how much stuff you've accomplished in life on incomplete. Think about how much stuff you accomplished in life with a lacking prayer life. 
Think about how much you've accomplished in life with skipping out every now and then on your tithes. Think about how much you've accomplished in life when you've cursed more people out than you've praised God in the spirit. Think about how much you've accomplished in life when you often allow your sister girl and your homeboy to come out in professional spaces. But yet the God you serve has the propensity and the ability and the willingness to still bless you in spite of you. That same sentiment of accomplishment that you've experienced while operating a life on the level of incomplete. What do you think would happen if you really give your all to Jesus? Don't mess with me today. What do you think would happen if you get sold out for God? What do you think would happen if when your feet hit the pavement, you don't move another father without falling on your knees and saying, Father, I stretch my hands to thee. What do you think would happen if you fast a little more and you stop going to some of the places that you're going and you stop doing some of the stuff you were doing? I know God looks beyond our faults, but some of our faults we got to stop doing. Look at your neighbor and say it's time to get off incomplete. Because when you live your life on incomplete, that means you have the propensity to die with unfinished business, unresolved conflict, unaddressed turmoil. And the God I serve allowed the biblical writer Phil to say, I come that you might have life. That word life is synonymous to breath. And that word breath synonymous to vigor. In other words, God has called us to have vigor and to operate in the freshing and refreshing of the Holy Spirit. That when we move into certain spaces, atmospheres shift and doors are open and windows are open and people are set free at the very presence of us. But we cannot set someone free if we are not free ourselves. I'm calling for a church who is tired of living a good enough life. I'm calling for a church who is tired of living a just to get by life. But I'm calling for a church who will say, God, I need your Holy Spirit to fill me. I'm tired of being gutter and praise it on Sunday. I want to be holy on Sunday, but I want to go to work holy on Monday. I want to go to work holy on Tuesday. On Wednesday, I want to speak in tongue in the break room because if it had not been for the Lord who was on your side look at your neighbor and say you got to come up a little higher you got to get out that gutter you got to get out that sewer the sewer is a place for rats and look at your neighbor and say I'm no rat I don't care what they say, how they say it, and when they say it. God has more for you. But in order for God to get it to you, you got to have more for yourself. More faith, more praise, more joy, more fasting, more serving, more commitment. Look at your neighbor and say, you got to come on up. Because when I operate my life on incomplete, then if I'm not careful, two first cousins start to mess with me. And their names are doubt and wary. The reason why some of us are doubting and the reason why some of us are worrying because you don't have a complete faith. Because I, my Bible tells me that faith is the substance of things hoped for. And it is the evidence of things not seen. 
that although I don't see it in the natural, it does not mean that God is not baking it in the spiritual. And I'm just waiting for the manifestation. But while I'm waiting for the manifestation, I have the responsibility to be in matriculation. In other words, I'm still moving toward that which I do not see yet because I know if God said it, that settles it. Look at your neighbor and say, you don't have to worry no more because God said it. That's why when a contractor's called me and said, I got to do this, do it. That's why when they said it's going to cost more, do it. Because when God said it, where there is vision, there is provision. And even if I don't see it in a bank account, I know God has a way of opening up some doors to let the stuff flow on in. So I'm no longer walking by sight. I'm walking by faith. Because the word said, for without faith, it is impossible to please God. And I don't want to be anything if I'm not pleasing God. Look at your neighbor and say, it's on a way just have some faith that wasn't the right neighbor they don't believe find you another neighbor and say hey just have some faith that wasn't the right neighbor either just tap your own self on the shoulder and say self have some faith faith that would move mountains faith that would open up doors faith that will move atmospheres faith that will cause breakthroughs faith that will shift seasons look at your neighbor and say faith 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 and so Here's the problem, church. We have been looking for the right answers in the wrong places. The answers is not in their DM. Okay, okay, all right. The answers is not in conversation. And so my brothers and sisters, this hence is my premise today. Where have you been looking? Think about that now because a solution is not a solution if it does not resolve something. It is just an idea. But a solution fixes the matter. A solution corrects the matter. But here God's saying that I cannot correct it because they're looking in the wrong place. This is why I love scripture because scripture has a way of foreshadowing that which we experience in the 21st century. Isn't it amazing how this first century text written for another group of people, but God breathed on it, allowed it to be canonized, that means put in the Bible, and create this pericope, that means this particular text, that we may consume it with great theological pragmatic ideas. Look at your neighbor and say, whatever he said, I believe it. I don't know all those words, but whatever he said, I'm going to trust him today. And so Jesus, he alarms his disciples of the importance of not looking for the right stuff in wrong places. And Jesus says in this particular text to his disciples as he's having a fireside chat on the mountain with them. He tells them to have a few considerations in terms of your looking. Number one, he says, consider what you are craving. I'm about to mess up right around in here. He says, consider what you're craving. You look at the Bible in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, the first two words, the Lord of the text says, but seek. I can't even go any further. But seek. But means that he's already taught some stuff before he uttered the word but. In other words, he's laid a premise, a foundation, and he's laid the antithesis of what it looks like if you do not seek. Seek. 
So he talks to them about making the wrong choices, looking for it in the wrong places. He talks to them about wearing and about not having faith. But then he said, I'm not going to leave you there because I've messed with your spiritual equilibrium. Now it's time for me to give you the grace in the space of the text. He says that if you transition from wearing, then you operate in your craving. He says, but seek. Now, I know none of you all don't really get me yet, but let me tell you this. What if I told you? That that word seek from its Greek rendering is a type of craving. In other words, he says, consider what you're craving. What is craving? Craving is the desire to consume. A lot of times, many of us don't even be hungry. But we see something that looks good. And we allow our eyes to translate to the fork and the fork to translate to our mouth and we eat based off what we see but not how we feel. One of the biggest sins in America is gluttony. Somebody shout hallelujah. And when that stomach of yours tells you that you've had enough, it's not time to put a little bit more up in it. Y'all miss this up in here. But here we are. We go from house to house on Thanksgiving. And we eat turkey and dressing here, chitlins there, uh, roast there. We eat cornbread there. And you put eight, 9,000 uh, calories in your body. And then you can't get in your outfit the next week. And you just squeeze yourself in something that you ate yourself out of. I need to talk to somebody but it all started with not what you ate it started with what you looked at y'all missed it up in here you looked at something that you shouldn't have but you got it anyway because you did not listen to the signs of your belly telling you that you shouldn't have it anyway and that's how we are in life some of the stuff that we are consuming on a daily basis it is because our eyes are not trained to look unto the hills from which coming our help and our help coming from the Lord look at your neighbor and say watch what you crave you desire some stuff because they make it look good and they dress it up but they not telling you how infected their relationship is just because they look good on the red carpet they not looking good on their own carpet because they'll smile in the camera and they'll fuss all the way home look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor watch what you crave because to whom much is given We must be careful, get this now, with what we allow our appetites to become familiar with. Some of us are spiritually constipated because we're consuming stuff that is not digestible. I'll say that again. I said some of us are spiritually constipated because we're co consuming stuff that is not spiritually digestible. And then you want God to do all this stuff and put goodness on that, but God cannot put goodness on that until you let that out of you so God can put something else back in you. Some of us need to learn how to go on a spiritual detox because we need to free ourselves from the food poison that we have allowed to consume in our body based off what we crave. Look at your neighbor and say, address the poison poisoning before you desire something else stop trying to get my God to build a temple on your carnality I said stop trying to get my God to build a temple on your carnality the devil is a liar you can't live any kind of way and expect God to bless that lifestyle I know y'all don't want to hear this type of preaching but you got to learn how to, to bring your standards up in life because the more you dumb in your standards the more you make our God look bad but if you have enough faith and say I would like to do that but the God in me told me I cannot But here's the problem. Our appetite have become familiar with carnality. In other words, it don't even bother you to sin no more. Whenever you operate in spaces that you know you don't have no business doing and there is no conviction, you have now got a spiritual eviction. In other words, God will still love you, but you will not be able to lay your hands on the sick and they shall recover. Your prayer ain't reaching nowhere. 
I don't care how articulate you are in your prayer. It ain't about what you can say. It's about how you're living because the blood still work. I can get up here and say the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood, and it ought to shake somebody without me having to say any fancy words. Because it reaches to the highest mountain and it flows. We've allowed our appetite to become too familiar with stuff that is not sanctioned by God. Because we have cheapened this idea of grace. Grace is God's unmerited favor that he gives to you even when you don't deserve it but you don't abuse it because you don't deserve it. You want to see some stuff shift in your life start removing some people and some stuff that is not of God and you'll find yourself freer as a bird. The one thing I always told myself I will never live in a house where there is no peace. I will kick you out before I allow you to destroy my peace. I got to go to work sometime and I ain't got no peace. The devil is a liar if you think that I'm going to go home and argue in the house that I paid for. But your appetite desires something you ain't ready for. And so you've been looking in the devil's restaurant, ordering off his menu. Y'all miss this up in here. But you got to look to where God has called you to look. What have I told you if you really find your purpose, you are elevating life? Somebody asked me, what is purpose? Purpose is when gifts marry impact. How do I know I'm in purpose when I discover what I'm gifted in and when I use those gifts to create impact in the world? If I'm not creating impact with my gift, I'm out of purpose. I just said something up in here. I said purpose is when your giftings marry impact. In other words, I find out what I'm good at and I use what I'm good at to impact the lives of people. And then what God will start doing is funding my purpose because I'm using my giftings to create an impact. This is why I don't sit on everybody board no more because your board is not found in my purpose. And so, what do you need to regurgitate that you've allowed to settle in your spirit because you've allowed your eyes to crave something that God never intended on you having? Somebody shout out craving. The second consideration you need to do, you need to consider this thing called a compass. Compass. A compass is a ancient navigational system it is something that shows us where we should go he says but seek he says consider your craves but then he says but seek ye first the kingdom of God in other words he says consider your compass when you're trying to accomplish something see this idea of the kingdom of God elder McDaniel it indicates God's dominion. It indicates God's rulership. So Jesus essentially says to the disciples that you must be willing to look in the direction of God first. Here's the problem. We want God to meet our needs, but we're not looking at God. Because sometimes God is in places where our flesh is uncomfortable with being. I'll say it again. Sometimes God is in places where our flesh is uncomfortable in being. Because you can't serve two masters. Can I say that again? Sometimes God will have you look at him in areas that are uncomfortable to you. The way I know that God is moving me is when God tells me to do some stuff that I don't really want to do. Because when God tells me to do some stuff that I really don't want to do, God is testing my will. And I'm reminded of a scripture in the Bible when Jesus, God himself incarnate, said, I don't want to do it, but not thy will, your will be done. Look at your neighbor and say, it ain't even about you. 
God just choose to make it about you because God is good. This thing ain't about you with your arrogant, stuck up, pompous self. This thing ain't about you. You want everything to fall right in your lap and you don't want to grind in the Holy Spirit. It hits better when you work for it. I said it hits better when you work for it. When God grows your business because you work, it hits better. When God heals your body because you believe, it hits better. Look at your neighbor and say, you got to work for something. You don't want to work no more. Such a lazy culture that we are perpetuated in a society. You want everything quick, fast, and in a hurry. I've worked 18 years to get to this point. Somebody shout hallelujah. And the devil is a liar. You want it overnight. Sometimes God will have to trust you enough to know that you trust him. But the only way that I'm able to make it because I understand where my help really comes from. Uh, let, let me say it like this. Let, let me say it like this. Uh, 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 uh. I believe that we are in a season where God is favoring the willing. <sighs> I'm going to say it again. I said I believe that we moved into a season where God is doing what? God wants your yes but God don't need your yes. See, we have dummied the spirit down to believe that God needs you. God don't need you. God wants you. God needs nothing that God created because he can destroy it as easy as he created it. So, I would rather serve a God who wants me than need me. Because if I serve a God who needs me, that means the operation of the spirit depends on my yes. But isn't it something that when you tell God no, he'll put that vision to somebody else. Mm. And they'll tell him yes, and that person will grow into something you were supposed to grow into. Because calling has to operate no matter you do it or not. And so if you don't answer the call, he'll put it in some four-year-old belly. And they'll start walking in something that you lived 50 years for and you ain't done nothing yet. Because we're not operating in the kingdom of God. That's the place where God rules. This is what I like about God. God desires never demands. In other words, God desires for us to follow his rule, but he gives us permissive will to go against his will. That's why some of you all are undelivered because you've operated in disobedience. But if you operate in destiny, then you'll submit yourself to the divine. My destiny is in my ability to submit myself to the divine. There is no destiny without divinity. We are the church. Y'all miss this up in here. And if the church come together, one can put a thousand in flight. Two can put ten thousand in flight. Just what happened if I get a hundred of y'all sold out for God? We'll take over this block. We'll take over this city. We'll take over this community. We'll take over a hospital. We'll go to the projects. We'll do all that. We'll pull them up out of the strip club. Look at your neighbor. But some of us can't pull them out because we're too busy throwing our dollars on the stage. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do this today. Come on, calm down, Andy. You're trying to get people delivered from stuff you ain't even delivered from. That's why I don't tell too many people to pray for me because I don't know what your lifestyle is. You can't pray for me because in essence you'll be praying over me. P-R-E-Y. Because jealousy will always expose itself. I got some people right now talking about who do you think he is. It ain't who I think I am. It's who God called me to be. A bold warrior for him to demand and command and shift atmospheres. And I will operate in what he told me to do. I don't care who likes it. Because I told God, I'm going to give you my yes. Yes to your will. Yes to your way. Yes, I will go. Just looking for your yes. Seek ye first. 
the kingdom of God. Then he says, let's move, Layla. And then you got to seek all of God's righteousness. Now, the surface understanding of righteousness is the justification of God. That's surface. But there's a deeper underbelly from that rendering of the word righteousness. The deeper content and connotation feel is when God gives you God's approval. In other words, he says, seek God's approval. Here is the problem. You risk God's approval at the expense of trying to get other folks to like you. I want him to think of me some kind of way. I don't want him to think. That's the wrong way to look. I used to seek man's approval. Man, I used to sit down for preaching. I wonder did they get the lesson today. I wonder did they hear me. I don't care whether you got it or not. If you don't get it, that's on you. I'm doing what God told me to do because I know God has anointed me to preach and you got to submit to what God is saying. And some of y'all be sitting there looking at me like y'all been eating lemons for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and a snack. But I'll preach right through that lemon spirit because I'm going to make some lemonade out of you. Yeah, you're going to come under submission of this Holy Ghost. I'll work with you until you understand that you cannot control the Holy Spirit in me. I'll get that devil out of you. I said I'll get that devil out of you. I'll get your mind back together. Your heart re-regulated. Your atmosphere to change because eyes have not seen. Before you make another decision, you need to ask God, God, what do you think about this? Can, can I let you in on a little secret? Your way haven't worked anyway. You've been doing it your way, you still broke. You still ain't got nobody. You still ain't going nowhere. Y'all missing something here. How about try God's way? Because God's way will make you feel good even when you ain't got no money. Who will empower you even when you're homeless. Who will give you joy even when you lost your job. Look at your neighbor and say, you don't know what I'm going through. Because the God I serve is too great for me to show you what I'm going through. I will bless the Lord. And all t- I said I will bless the Lord. I said I will bless the Lord. Y'all ain't got it yet. I said we will bless the Lord at all times and his praises. And so I got to watch what I crave. I got to consider my compass, the direction I'm looking at God first. But then when I get my cravings together, and when I get my compass going toward God, then I can have the final thing, and that is confidence. There is no confidence when you're craving the wrong stuff. There is no confidence when you're going in the wrong direction. What I love about this text is that Jesus makes the promise conditional. This is why I always ask God, why did you give me the gift of prophecy? Because people will miss the prophecy because they're not understanding that words come with condition and some prophecy will reach your spirit before it reach your intellect. And so you're so busy looking at the literal sense. Oh, y'all miss this up in here. And so I use certain words, and you're looking at it from a literal perspective, but I'm not even talking about you. I'm talking to your spirit. So if I say something like you was going to destroy yourself, what I'm really saying is your spirit is trying to destroy yourself. You just don't see it yet because you're not spiritually connected to my Holy Ghost. But I'll still preach to that devil. 
Oh, I done just said something. Y'all ain't said nothing about that, huh? But not only is that, sometimes prophecy is conditional. If I tell you that God is going to give you an increase, you don't wait, you go get it. If I tell you God wants you to transition jobs, you don't just stay there. You start putting in applications. If I say God is going to expand your business, go do something. You have to play a part in your breakthrough. This is a partnership, not a dictatorship. I can't say God wants our church to grow and I don't challenge you to go get nobody. And so, here's the condition. He says, if you seek ye first the kingdom of God and all of God's righteousness. Let's move, Layla. He said, and then all these things will be given to you. I like when the text is ambiguous because it gives us theological permission to imagine. When he says these things, it gives us a chance to look at this text autobiographically. Autobiographically means to self-impose our terminology in the text. What are some things you need from God to go to the next level. See, the problem is we don't imagine big enough. God is bigger than your light bill. You still on electric anointing. time for that. God is bigger than your headache or you hurt your toe and now you need the pastor to come lay hands on your f- the devil is a liar. Girl, you better put some Neosporin on that, Neosporin on that thing. <laughs> Call me for the big stuff. When you feel like you're about to throw in the towel and the devil been mad. Don't call me because you got a headache. Because you got to have no power to pray over that yourself. I'm the big gun. I come with a Uzi. Call me when you need me to take out the enemy. Y'all miss us up in here. How many people saw Harlem Knights? And when they was shooting that window, pap, 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 man, stop doing that. I'm not coming with a pap, pap. I'm coming to tell the devil that whatever God has for the members of this church that you gotta get your hands off of them in the name of Jesus because all these things will be added unto them look at your neighbor and say neighbor you got to welcome what God is trying to give you I said look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor you gotta welcome what God is trying to give to you because what God has for you it is for you I wish I had a couple people in the house today to tell the Lord say Lord whatever you are doing in this season don't do it without me I said tell the Lord whatever you doing come on here in this season don't do it without me I don't hoop too much any longer but I want to tell somebody that God is about to open some doors in your life God is about to open some doors in your life do me a favor look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor say neighbor lift up your hands and throw your head back because the joy of the Lord is your strength have I got a witness here I said have I got a witness I said all of these things will be added unto you victory will be added unto you victory shall be added joy shall be added peace 
peace shall be added. Hope shall be added. Let the church say amen. Open up your mouth and tell the Lord. Tell him thank you. I said tell him thank you. I need about 20 of y'all to open up your mouth and say thank you because you brought me from a mighty long way. Thank you because you woke me up, put food on my table, clothes on my back. Won't he do it? I said won't he do it? Won't he make a way out of no way? Won't he do it? Won't he, won't he? Won't he, won't he? Won't he, won't he? Shout it, yeah! Shout it, yeah! Yeah! I know he's all right. I, I, I know he's all right. I know he's all right. I gotta go. But Lord, wherever elder love is, I speak healing now. In the mighty name of Jesus, I tell you, God, touch him from his head to his toe. Have I got a witness here? But not only do I speak healing over him, anybody in this house that needs you to do something, I speak healing over your life. Somebody shout hallelujah. Elder McDaniel, it was only a blimp, but I'm glad you're still here. Jessica, it was only a blimp, but I'm glad you're still here because what the devil meant for your bad, God, God meant it for your good. That's why you gotta shout because a new car is coming. That's why you gotta shout because a new car is coming. That's why you gotta shout because new income is coming. That's why you gotta shout because new healing is coming. Devil, you messed with the wrong one. I need somebody to open up your mouth and call the devil. Tell him, devil, you a liar. I said, devil, you a liar. Ah, you gotta open up your mouth. Tell him, you a liar. You a liar. I said, he's a liar. I said, he's a liar. Open up your mouth. Favor on your house. Favor on your life. Favor on your kids. Favor on your future. Yeah! I know it's all right. Everybody stand there. 